Can you hear me? Hey, good evening. Welcome to uh, the second talk for tonight, uh, part of the talks that started today at Fiber Festival, the first day of this festival, um, three-day program. And um, for this talk, we're having two guests as well and is on Xeno Futures, Breaking Down Barriers with Biohacking, Technology and Speculation. I want first to welcome everybody in this room, um, as well as our guest here live in the space, Adriana Knuff. And I uh, want to thank everybody, people, the people who are working on the technical setup in the back. And um, yeah, just to acknowledge your presence here. And uh, my name is Hilda Musharafiye, and I'll be hosting tonight's panel and tell you a little bit about it. Also, we'll be joined by uh, audience online. So if they're already hearing us, I'd also like to welcome them um, into this tonight's panel talk. A little bit of introduction of tonight's talk before I introduce our guests. So as I said, is on Xeno Futures. Under the current capitalist system, identities and bodies are held captive in the way they were born. Free experimentation with transformation is rejected. Simultaneously, capitalist petrochemical and pharmaceutical systems create global pollution and cause unwanted and unregistered kind of mutations in humans and non-humans alike. Artists and biohackers reveal and break through these systems using DIY speculative art projects, experimenting on the self to achieve body autonomy and disalienation from the destructive constraint that capitalist capitalism places on us. In this session, as I mentioned, we'll be joined by two guests. With us in the space is Adriana Knuff, and online is Mary Magic, who I'll introduce in a bit. Um, they will walk through um, in their experimental research at the intersection of biohacking, technology, and science. So first up for our first guest, if I may introduce you, Adriana. Adriana Knuff works as an artist, writer, and xenologist. She engages with topics such as wet media, space art, satellites, radio transmission, non-human encounters, drone flight, queer and trans futurities, machine learning, the voice, and paper making. She's the founding facilitator at the Transino Lab, a nomadic artistic research laboratory that promotes entanglements among entities trans and xeno. Adriana regularly presents her artistic research around the world and beyond, including a work that has flown abroad the International Space Station, which she will guide us through, through her presentation. Her work has been recognized by a number of awards, including an award of distinction at Prior's Electronica, an honorary mention from the Science Fiction Research Association's Innovative Research Award, and as a prize winner in the Lakes Works for Radio Number no. 4. Adriana currently teaches at the Master's Ecology Futures at the St. Joost School of Art and Design in the Netherlands. So welcome, Adriana. And uh, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for that introduction. And I'm delighted to be here with you all tonight in person and online. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be talking a little bit about my art projects and some of the research that goes on um, around them and some of the, the conceptual aspects um, that are related to them. So if we can switch to my presentation, please. Um, that would be great. So all right, there we go, excellent. So yeah, as was outlined in the introduction, I have um, a number of sort of backgrounds that I, that I pull into my work, um, some training as a scientist, um, as a designer, as an engineer, um, writer and art, as an artist. And so I sort of uh, combine all of these aspects of my work um, in the projects that I do. So um, sort of the, the scientific training that I had was rather constrained. <laughs> um, and so a lot of the artwork has been a way to sort of take some of the roots and some of the specifics of that scientific training, um, as well as the training in engineering to in trying to move that into new sorts of domains and new sorts of potentialities. But really, recently, I've been calling myself a xenologist. Um, and so I sort of want to explain what I mean by this. Um, and this is a term that I've sort of uh, reappropriated um, from some aspects of um, earlier thought. So what is xenology? 
So xenology is the study, analysis, and development of a strange alien or other. And a xenologist is, of course, one who engages in xenology. So xenology as a term was something that was originally developed in the 1950s or 1960s um, by people who are trying to understand or trying to, to describe how one would characterize uh, extraterrestrial life within science fiction books or writing or television or something like this. So the sci-fi author Robert Heinlein was one of the first people to, to be developing this term. Um, then in the 1980s, there was a guy by the name of Robert Freitas who was extending this to, ha to the actual study of extraterrestrial life. So from the context of the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. So the idea is that xenology be, would be one who would be studying these actually existing extraterrestrials. Um, and so my work starts from this question of the alien as extraterrestrial, but actually sort of pushes beyond that or, or wants to think beyond that. So I'm curious, I'm interested in that space of the alien, but I also want to incorporate other types of thought into it, such as queer and trans and post-colonial approaches to things to sort of push against the triumphalist, colonialist, extractivist mindset of a lot of um, um, older science fiction. Um, but, uh, but in my case, I'm actually drawing from some aspects of, of feminist and queer science fiction as well that I'll bring up later in the presentation. Um, so for me, xenology really means uh, not running away from the strange alien or the other, but rather highlighting it and foregrounding it and understanding it as something that is absolutely necessary for our practices these days under capitalism. Um, and so I see xenology as a way to push ourselves into new configurations of our bodies, of ourselves, of our being, of our existence in, sp in space on Earth and in outer space as well, which I'll get to in a little bit. And we do this through the integration of quote unquote unnatural elements into our bodily existences. And so this leads me to um, a word that I did make up, which is a mouthful, called xenomographication. <laughs> and so let me explain this a little bit. And it was actually very similar to, to what uh, you had in the introduction there. Um, so I see that under capitalism, there are certain changes that we are allowed to make with our bodies, with our lives and everything like this, but it only that which allows one to make a profit, right? And so that I see as alienation. Xenomographication is meant to highlight sort of the, and I mean this in all the senses of the word, grotesque aspects um, to, of change um, for purposes of disalienation, actually. So rather than capitalist alienation making us or preventing us from having access to all sorts of types of change, Xenomographication and xenology is meant to sort of push beyond that. And so it's actually disalienation from sort of the, the ways in which capitalism prevents us from making these types of changes to our bodies and so forth. Um, so, so because I really sort of see one of the things about the universe is a basis in change. And so there are lots of possibilities for modifying ourselves, modifying our relations to, our, to other entities, other beings in the universe um, that is not necessarily possible under contemporary capitalism and extractivism and so forth. Um, so in order to sort of make, make this, these ideas more concrete, I want to go through um, a number of the projects that I've been working on in recent years. And a number of these um, relate to the relationship between bodies, outer space, and medicine. So um, this is a, a, a poster that I made um, a little while ago, and the numbers are a little bit out of date, but the general trends still uh, remain the same. So basically, only 11.5% of space travelers have been women, 2.5% have been African American, None, as far as we know of, have been transgender or non-binary. Very few have been queer or trans. And on this, um, on this poster, there's actually asterisks next to the lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender and, and non-binary because it's entirely possible that these astronauts and space travelers have been queer, trans, or non-binary, and they just have not been able to come out, right? So I want to make, clear, make that clear. Um, but, you know, Space is something that's been basically for white men <laughs> um, uh, up until very, very recently, um, primarily. Um, and so this is something, you know, I have a, I've had a desire for a long time to go to space, um, partially because of different experiences that I had growing up, which I'll get to in a little bit. Um, and so a few years ago, I was able to actually enact some aspects of this desire to go to space with this project called TX1. 
So TX-1 was a project that was launched on March 7th, 2020 to the International Space Station. And I'll get into a little bit what the project was in a moment, um, but like any good uh, project that goes to space, we had a patch. Um, this was designed by the uh, Serbian graphic designer Ymir Pushkarevich, and I got actually have a bunch of these patches here, or stickers actually. So, um, you know, if you're interested, come see me afterwards. Um, I'd be, be happy to give them out. So basically, this is a project where I launched fragments of my hormone replacement medications to the space station, and so they were launched in encased in these three spheres here. So on the left is a fragment of my spironolactone pill, which is given to transgender women in the United States to suppress testosterone. In the middle is a fragment of an estrogen patch, which is what I take to provide me with estrogen. And on the right is a fragment of a handmade paper sculpture, which I included to sort of gesture towards all the other Xeno entities that I couldn't put in this project, and also to sort of gesture towards a, some letter writing that I also do in my work. Um, the important thing that I want to say about the estrogen patch is it's one that I actually wore. <laughs> I had already worn it before, and I didn't tell NASA this <laughs> um, because it may not have been allowed to go to space. Um, basically, what, the me what it means, the fact that it, it was one that I had already worn, means that it had parts of my dead skin cells on it or clothing lint or skin microbiome or things like this. So it wasn't just sort of the hormone replacement medications that went up there, but a small part of myself as well. Um, a good friend of mine has always said that you never go to space alone, and it was very much true uh, with this project. So TX1 was part of a total of nine artist groups that were also launched to the space station at the same time as part of a project called Sojourner 2020. And this was a project of the MIT Space Exploration Initiative. Um, and one of the important things that I want to say about this is that this is also a very diverse group of artists that were involved. So there are artists who are indigenous North American, artists from Peru, Argentina, Thailand, and so forth, which also really opened up the space, no pun intended, of people who, who were able to send things to the International Space Station. So this project was launched on March 7th, 2020. And if we recall, there were some things going on in the world at that time, right? COVID lockdowns and everything beginning in the global north. Um, so it was very interesting to think about this project going to the, one of the most isolated places for humans that we know of, right? Um, at the same time that many of us in the global north were entering into our own forms of isolation. But this uh, video is a um, video that we got from the space station uh, during the time that the project was aboard. Um, if you look on the far left um, one there, you'll see uh, someone's project floating around a little bit, so you could actually see it's in microgravity. Um, so these three layers of the sculpture, um, one layer was rotating to simulate Mars gravity, and the bottom layer was rotating to simulate moon gravity, and that's where TX1 was in order to sort of uh, gesture towards the feminine understandings of Luna. But just as importantly, TX1 came back to Earth um, on April 7th, 2020. So rather than being burned up in the atmosphere or d being destroyed or things like this, it was able to come back. And for me, that's very important from questions of sort of queer and trans resilience, right? Rather than just being disposed of, we were actually able to come back and in a sense thrive once again. And I don't have the actual TX1 with me right here because I tend to not like to travel with it. Um, but I have sort of a small model here that you know I'm happy to show people um, if they're interested to sort of get a size of it, a sense of the size of it. So recently, this project, um, as was mentioned in the introduction, won an award and was exhibited at uh, Pre Ars Electronica. And it was um, exhibited in relationship to this blue box here, which was also something that was flown on a space shuttle mission back in the 1990s that you can buy on eBay. <laughs> um, but in addition to this, um, there was a three-channel video that I created to sort of explore some more aspects of this work. Um, to explore questions of alienness and ruralness, because um, I grew in, up in a very small uh, town in the United States. Um, to look at what types of bodies get to go to space, and to also look at queer and trans representation in sci-fi film and television. Um, so this was a 17-minute um, um, uh, yeah, video art piece, but I want to show a couple of minutes of clips from this uh, to give you an idea and 
um, to go into some of the more details of, of the project. And um, the voiceover that you hear is my own voiceover that was also presented in the form of letters, um, letters to extraterrestrials, basically. There's no payload on it yet, and there won't be until right before launch. Dear Interlocutor, I've been unable to tell you much about my hometown, which is unfair because that place is so fundamental to why I'm continuously searching for you. It's hard to convey to you how small my village was. I tend to describe it this way. Badger is a town of 600 people in the middle of nowhere in Iowa. Of course, that's not entirely true. In fact, there were miles upon miles upon miles of cornfields and soybean fields and hog and chicken confinements. When the wind was just right, the stench of manure from the eggplant four miles to the west would drift into town. In short, it is an industrial wasteland of contemporary agriculture. When I lived there, my house was at the eastern edge of the town, our backyard abutting the endless fields. Corn one year, soybeans the next. Our organic garden next to the herbicide-drenched fields. I wasn't allowed to leave the boundaries of the town. The county road that passed right next to my house was too dangerous as a semi-trailer is carrying the grain barreled down the highway at 55 miles per hour. The road itself was paralleled by deep ditches that held the snow during the gray, frigid winters. So, I was effectively confined to Badger. I'd ride my bike around and around the circumference of the town so many times that the nosy housewives would peer at me from behind their drawn curtains, eyeing me with an air of suspicion. You don't know surveillance until you've lived in a small community. And so then this um, next clip that I'm going to show you is from... The, oh, There's no payload. Sorry. Lives um, require let me just pause this briefly. I'll come back to it in a moment. Um, the next clip that I'm going to show you is basically um, from the third part of the uh, video installation. Um, that's, again, looking at sort of representations of queerness in, in contemporary sci-fi. Okay, let's see if I can get this working again. Lives require living in the shadows, lest they end in violence. In times that have been erased, maybe we didn't have to do this. For too long, we didn't exist in the televisual future. Maybe a wink wink nod nod here and there, that being all that was allowed by the corporate censors. Don't you represent Angel? How are you gonna do right by both of us? What's she gonna say when I start booking more jobs than her? You're a charming boy, and you've got a silver tongue with plenty of ambition. But look no further than your recently clocked girlfriend to know that you may as well be looking to train the girls to be astronauts. We still aren't beings who are allowed to go to space to try and meet you. Gatekeeping prevents us from passing their tests. We're set up to fail by the choices we make to live as we want to live. We're going to have to find another way to get to you. Times can change for the better, even while they simultaneously get worse. Time isn't linear. It's a palimpsest of the times to come that we desire, times that have just passed, times that we are in now, times that we think maybe have happened. But now we have some future times where we exist. And in those new future times, we're well on our way to meeting you or some human-centered imaginary of you. Hi, are you codependent lesbian space alien? Yeah, hi. <laughs> That's a really great costume.
It's good to see you. My people can change sex to transition from female to male in order to reproduce. Like several species of reptiles and fish can do it. It's not uncommon in nature. How do you change? This pool. Existence. So um, this this segment then goes on to sort of explore as far as I was able to find through my research, basically all of the examples of queer and trans and non-binary representation in visual sci-fi film and television, at least that I know of, at least from, from sort of like the, the sources that I was able to be made aware of. And that number is around 18, <laughs> 18 or 20 examples or something like this. Um, and most of it's in recent years. Um, although there's some very interesting uh, uh, film films, um, actually the one that it got cut off right here um, is one from Argentina called Brief Histories from a Green Planet that involves a trans woman and her relationship with her grandma's alien. And I mean that <laughs> seriously, her grandma's alien. It's a great film if you get a chance to watch it. Um, so yeah, I think what I, I will do is uh, talk a little bit about some of the other projects that um, came out of this TX1 uh, research. Um, and so uh, the main sort of overarching project for this is called Xenological Entanglements 001 Eromatase. And this was a project that was funded by a biofriction residency. Um, and I was able to do it um, uh, when I was in residence at the Kersnikova Institute and Kapelica Gallery in Ljubljana in Slovenia. And the idea with this project was to think about my own desire to go to space um, and what I would need on a long duration space mission. Um, and one of the main things that I would need would be a source for my own hormones. And so how would I do that? Well, the idea with this project was to think about genetically engineering my own testicular cells so that they would produce estrogen rather than testosterone. And so the idea was to try and turn on a particular gene in our cells to basically convert testosterone into estrogen because that's sort of the normal um, procedure for or, or pathway for doing that within our cells. And so it's an enzyme called aromatase. Uh, so the idea was to try and turn on this enzyme. Um, sounds very simple to describe. It's wickedly hard to do uh, in practicality and was made more difficult because of COVID lockdowns and, and lack of access to research labs and things like that. So the project had to change um, in a sort of a number of ways. Um, one of the things that sort of came out of this is a performance um, that I did um, about sort of being addicted to estrogen, <laughs> as I feel like I am, um, different aspects of the transgender voice and so forth. This performance was called Trying Plastic Variations, and due to lack of time, I'm not going to sort of go into that right now, but you can find some performance clips um, online. Um, so there was a lot of sort of laboratory work that we had to do to sort of begin this process. Um, and one of the most important things that we had to do was develop some of our own research hardware. Uh, because scientific uh, research uh, practices are very expensive, especially in the hardware that you need to do the research. Um, and so one of the huge parts of, yeah, my work, along with Mary Magic's work and other people's work, is developing our own uh, tools. And so while it's, and it's also very expensive to send things to outer space. <laughs> so they, what you need is a, you need a way to simulate microgravity on Earth. And so you do this through uh, what's called a clinostat. And a clinostat basically rotates at a certain speed so that you can grow cells within this vessel here that you see on the screen. And while this thing is rotating, the vessels are basic, or the cells are basically experiencing weightlessness in a way. Um, so the, what was very important for this was to make this an open source project because usually this um, equipment costs many thousands of euros and so we're, we were able to reduce the cost to a few hundred euros and then opened up all of the designs and everything for this as well so that people who do want to, exp to, to experiment with some forms of microgravity are able to do this. Um, so this was one of the main um, developments of the project. 
Um, and then we also ended up doing things in a much more s uh, speculative realm as well. Again, because partially due to the sort of COVID restrictions that we were working with last year. Um, so then we created this speculative piece called uh, Sacular Fount, which imagined this possibility of producing my hormones through this device that I wore on the outside of my body. Um, and this shape is meant to uh, uh, represent testic testicles as a way to also push against the idea of certain types of the anatomy being associated with certain types of sexes and genders as well. Um, and so the design of this was also meant to uh, reference different types of BDSM type types of harnesses and stuff to also engage with some of the burden but also desire and joy of taking hormones and producing them and so forth. And so we did this kind of photo performance where we were, um, yeah, sort of also gesturing and, and exploring the, the way that the transgender body is looked at, um, referencing some very sort of standard types of space poses that you would uh, associate uh, with astronauts and so forth, but again, also the gaze and trying to sort of like really confront people looking at a transgender body and also trying to non present it in a non-sexualized sort of way. Um, so yeah, and then what brought me to Amsterdam <laughs> is this residency that I have at uh, Vach right now, which is part of the Art for Med Consortium. Um, and so the idea was to further develop this uh, research, but again, because of COVID, things had to be moved around a little bit. Um, and so what I started exploring is other possibilities of going to space and other ways of thinking about space travel, resilience, different types of organisms that exist in extreme environments and so forth. And so I got very interested in lichen. <laughs> So <laughs> let me explain this sort of jump here. Um, so lichen are this organism that's a symbiosis of fungi and algae. And they grow basically everywhere on Earth, on land, um, in the Arctic, in some of the most inhospitable places um, in the world. But they've also been sent to the space station. And they've been put on the outside of the space station for a year and a half, exposed to the ravages of space, the vacuum, the hot and cold, and everything like this. They were on the outside of the space station for a year and a half, then they're brought back to Earth, and they were still alive, or at least 75% of the cells were still alive. So this showed sort of, to me, this e extreme ability to withstand some of these uh, incredibly challenging situations and environments. And so um, I started making different types of uh, relationships uh, uh, with sort of aspects of queer and trans lives or lives of, you know, other types of bodies that are seen as alien or xeno on Earth. And sort of, yeah, how, how do we think about different aspects of resilience within this world? But then I also started thinking about, you know, maybe the bipedal human is not the right way to go to space. <laughs> maybe there is other relationships that we should have with other types of organisms um, for space travel. But I started thinking about this because there's this idea called the lithopanspermia hypothesis. Um, litho meaning rock and panspermia meaning sort of different types of life that travels out in outer space. The idea is, is that life on Earth maybe it didn't originate on Earth, but it actually originated somewhere else in the universe, encased in some rock that then sort of like travels throughout the universe for millions of years and then crashes on the planet Earth, right? So for me, I was also thinking about, well, maybe there's different types of relationships that we could have with lichen, you know, different aspects of the human self that could potentially be merged with lichen in some way and maybe encased wi within these rocks or something like this. So, you know, the, this is part of some of the research that I'm exploring these days. And, you know, I've, I've thought, I've been thinking a lot about it, sort of like why I'm so interested in sort of space and things like this, especially with everything that goes on in the world right now. But one of my very important um, influences as an artist and especially for the work that I'm doing right now is the work of Octavia Butler, who's an African-American uh, science fiction author. Um, and one of the books that's very um, influential for me right now is Parable of the Sower. And in Parable of the Sower, it takes place, it was written in like 19, 1990s, I think 1993. And it's about a future California in 2025, 
where there's fires, lack of water, <laughs> um, basically the apocalypse happening, happening around everyone. And within that book, there's a group of people who you know, come together and try and live throughout all of this, and they're animated by a desire to go to space. You know, so for me, it's not necessarily, everything that we think about about going to space is really about how do we want to live on Earth, right? How, and so to, sort of our imaginations of space you know, whether they come real or not, I'm less interested in that, and more I want to think about how does, how does that allow us to animate different types of things that we might do on Earth. And so, you know, that's again helping me think through sort of some of these aspects of why space, why now, why, why think about this when there's all these other things going on in the world. Um, so yeah, so um, stay tuned <laughs> for this Lycan project. Um, it's in the very early stages of this right now, but it's something that I'm actually getting to work with the students at St. Yost and Ecology Futures there. Um, and so we're doing a lot of, these are all images that uh, were taken in the laboratory there under the microscopes or of lichen that were collected um, on a research trip that we just did to Iceland a couple of weeks ago. Um, so, so yeah, so basically all of this work is part of what I call the Transino Lab, um, which consists of me <laughs> right now, but I'm always open for different types of collaborations and everything. Um, but uh, yeah, and I think what I'll do is I'll just stop there and uh, thanks. Thank you so much, Adriana. I think it also already opens so many questions about um, the current research and its uh, relation to the the specimen that uh, you have here, which like also seeing it in plain sight and uh, is like in its in its size about like almost how precious this must mm -hmm. or like its equivalent must have turned <laughs> in that uh, uh, construction that you had there, but also um, the relation between going like this non-linear time of going into previous primordial cellular beings mm -hmm. in order as well to imagine different kind of xenofuturisms. So um, I'll keep that uh, there with us now and uh, we'll move directly to our next uh, guest who will join us online. Um, but we will be taking questions at the end of the session, so please keep that noted um, and maybe also add it to uh, after our next guest speaker. Hello, Mary. Can you hear me? Let's test first if we can hear you. Yes, yes, yes. I can hear you. Hi, Mary. Um, I'm going to shortly introduce you before you start your presentation. Um, Mary is a non-binary Chinese-American artist currently living in Vienna. Their work spans amateur science, public workshopology, performance, installation, documentary film, and speculative fiction. Since 2015, Magic's research has centered on hormone biopolitics and environmental toxicity, and how the ethos and methodologies of biohacking can serve to demystify invisible lines of molecular biopower. In 2017, their project Open Source Estrogen was awarded honorary mention at Pre-Ars Electronica Hybrid Arts. And in 2019, Magic completed a 10-month Fulbright residency in Yogyakarta, Indonesia, investigating the role of Javanese mysticism in the plastic pollution crisis. Mary Magic is a current member of the online network Hacteria, open source biological art and the laboratory theater collective Aliens in Green. So Hectaria is the open source biological art and the laboratory theater collective is called Aliens in Green, as well as a recent contributor to the radical syllabus project Pirate Care. So thank you, Mary, I guess joining us from Austria, right? You're in now? Welcome. Yes. <laughs> So should I start? Yes, please go ahead. Thank you for the introduction and um, thank you to all the organizers of Fiber. I'm now going to share my screen. Okay, and the sound is fine? Yes. Okay. 
So um, I started this project called Open Source Estrogen in 2015, and it kind of expanded into a much larger body of work um, that now includes environmental toxicity, um, in addition to hormone biopolitics in general. But um, when I first started the project, um, one of the first questions I asked myself was, well, what is estrogen or how, how do we define estrogen? So I typed in estrogen into Google image search, and this is a screenshot that I got of my results. And um, as you can see, there's lots of images of like femininity and larger breast size and smoother skin. Uh, but then there's also lots of like pharmaceutical products like pills for hormone replacement therapy or for contraceptives or for menopausal symptoms. So it was very clear to me from the beginning that um, when we are hacking these hormones, like hacking molecules, we're not just hacking them as a as a material, but also the kind of material symbi sim symbolic um, power that it has within social ideology. So one of the main things I was interested in was, well, how did gender get codified by molecules? Like, how did we arrive at this black box fact that estrogen codes for femininity and testosterone codes for masculinity? So these are very, very like deeply entrenched um, perspectives that we have in society. And uh, the more I researched about hormones, uh, I couldn't ignore the fact that our entire planet is already colonized by these molecules. And I'm not talking about the natural hormones that we produce in our bodies, but I'm talking about this larger kind of um, capitalist industrial complex, which is um, primarily comprised of uh, petrochemical, pharmaceutical, and agricultural industries. So these industries, um, I, I like to call it like a kind of a funny paradox of living in the Anthropocene, because these industries are creating all these molecules, and there's all these residues in the environment, and they didn't intend for these molecules to be communicating to our bodies, but they do. And um, to kind of backtrack a little bit and describe what's happening at the molecular level, um, the green molecule represents the estrogen receptor. And scientists have called this receptor a promiscuous uh, receptor. So promiscuous being the opposite of selective. So that's why we have so many of these industrial molecules actually binding into the receptor and transfecting change. And um, uh, another important thing to note about the estrogen receptor is that it is highly conserved among all animal taxa, or actually all animal categories that have a vertebrate, actually. So all of these organisms, like non-human species, we share the same estrogen receptor. And so that's why that's why all the stuff that's happening to the frogs and fish and birds, like all these species that are experiencing population declines, like we have a shared species vulnerability with them. So this is kind of like a like a collective mutagenesis that is happening. And the effects, uh, they range a lot. So we tend to think of hormones as like, like estrogen and progesterone, testosterone. We tend to think of them as only sex hormones. But the effects actually, they, they can be neurological. So it's connected to ADHD, to autism, to lower IQ, to mood disorders, depression. And uh, there's also physiological symptoms like um, diabetes, uh, obesity early onset puberty. So lots of young girls are starting puberty at a very young age. Um, and for men, um, sperm count has dropped um, more than 50% in Europe. So this is like um, a pretty recent statistic. But um, and then there's also like really rare cervical cancers, testicular cancers, reproductive cancers that are linked to hormone disruption. So I mean, what does it mean to live in this world that is um, so polluted, but at the same time, this pollution is 
um, proving to us how fragile our definitions are. You know, these categories that we've constructed about uh, normativity, body normativity, heteronormativity, heterosexual. Uh, he yeah, so it's like all these definitions are quite fragile when you think about these molecules transfecting change in our bodies. Um, and I really like this quote, just as the body can be stolen, it can also be reclaimed. So um, I'm going to go into a bit of what I've been doing now. So um, there's lots of terms to describe what I do, like hormone hacking, freak science, estrogen geeking. But the phrase I like the most is public amateurism because, um, well, the term actually uh, is from Claire Pentecost, uh, an artist and a writer. And she defines it as uh, learning and doing and failing in the public sphere and kind of removing the hierarchy of the expert and the lay person. So I really like this definition and that's why I see this hormone hacking as uh, going beyond just like appropriating science. I mean, that's a very important part of what we do in terms of like knowledge production. But um, I feel like we're also creating these critical spaces for queering the status quo. And that status quo can be like, you know, how science is, is, is produced or how knowledge is, is produced, uh, but it, it can also be how bodies are defined, how our reality is defined, how our planetary is defined. So that's what I mean by the status quo. So one of the first things I looked into were um, these yeast biosensors. So I wanted to have a way to detect like if a certain like water sample had um, harmful levels of estrogen inside. So um, I, I got this like message from Josiah Zayner, who is like a, a famous biohacker. And he told me um, that there's like this gene that codes for human estrogen receptor. And so I bought this gene from, um, it's a DNA repository. So I bought it and then I transformed it into yeast. And the yeast actually turned yellow in the presence of estrogen. So this was really mind blowing for me because for the first time I can actually visualize the molecular semiosis that happens when the estrogen receptor is in contact with an estrogenic molecule. So it's like um, the yeast were like extensions of our bodies in that way. And this is kind of like the mobile lab that I was traveling with in order to do workshops about this topic. And um, the surprising thing is that I never got in trouble with airport security even though I was carrying like petri dishes of like transgenic yeast and like all of these like kind of flammable liquids and reagents and things like that. So I thought that was really interesting. And then um, when we're dealing with river samples, we also need to uh, concentrate them somehow because they're very dilute. So um, here is like a pretty simple um, protocol for solid phase extraction that is using this series of um, peristaltic pumps. So this is the this is kind of the mobile lab and inside that tin box uh, is the series of peristaltic pumps for concentrating your sample into a special um, filter called a C18 cartridge. And um, I skipped over one. So this is uh, another protocol I started looking into in 2016 and uh, it's, basically like a column chromatography experiment. So it's like basic chemistry, like for separating molecules or separating um, yeah, molecules by a property of size or property of polarity. So in this case, um, we are separating the hormones from the urine using their chemical properties. So, um, and this is also included in this mobile lab, which is like the, I call it the extraction lab. And here's like kind of a collage of images, a, li a little bit outdated, but um, this is how a lot of my workshops tend to look. And I like these images because it kind of goes against the sterile, white, clean space of a laboratory. And if you think about 
what is another uh, clean, white, sterile space is also the gallery or the museum. So I like, um, again, like um, going back to the querying of the status quo. And here's an image of what the hormones look like when they're extracted from the urine. And um, it's kind of interesting because um, when they're outside the body, they're actually acting as pheromones. And pheromones are able to influence um, yeah, your, your neurology, basically. And um, when we take turns smelling each other's hormones, everyone gets like a different reaction. It's either they, they hate the smell uh, or they like the smell or they don't smell anything at all. And that's because every single person has a different collection of nose receptors. So that's why it's so hard to study smell out of all the five senses. And um, if you think about how dogs react to each other when they're smelling each other's asses, it's kind of similar. Like dogs, like when they're smelling each other's asses, sometimes they really like each other. Sometimes they want to fight each other. And other times they just don't care. So I feel like the hormones are activating something very ancient and evolutionary in our minds. And um, from this kind of protocol, like experimenting with like hormones in the urine, I wanted to contextualize this in this fictional cooking show. And uh, it's a piece called Housewives Making Drugs. It's like a 10 minute film, but I really just want to show the first uh, act of the show. So um, if the organizers can play the clip of Housewives Making Drugs now. Since that fucking Cheeto head cut Obamacare, my hormones aren't covered anymore. This fucking sucks. Right? Oh, remember how hard it was last year just to get my hormones? That judgmental ass doctor. A transphobic healthcare system. Bureaucratic hoops and invasive body exams. And that shitty therapist referral I had to get just to prove that I was a real transgender. transgender. It's fucking 2017. I wish we didn't need to fight so hard for our healthcare. I know, right? I wish there was a way to get hormones without a prescription. Hmm. Hello! And, and welcome, welcome to, to our show. show! I'm Maria. And I'm Maria. And we are Housewives Making, Making Drugs. <laughs> On today's show, Marie and I are going to show you lovely viewers at home how to get hormones without needing that pesky doctor's prescription. That's right, Maria. We've concocted a recipe where we can reuse the estrogen that's naturally expelled from our bodies. So you're saying that this recipe would allow us to circumvent the whole industrial medical complex? And increase access to estrogen for trans women to gain radical body autonomy. What? By sharing hormones and tapping into new systems of interdependent community? And taking the phrase sharing, sharing is, is caring, caring to a whole new level. Wow. What? what do we need to make all of this happen? This, ladies and gentlemen, non-binary, agender, and gender non-conforming folks is the Astro Feminizer. <laughs> the only tool a real estrogen hacker needs to do her deed. The best part is all these ingredients are cheap and easy to find. Just how I like my men. <laughs> <laughs> It's uh, made up of silica gel and cigarette filters layered inside a modified glass bottle. As you can see, I found these items after a heavy night of drinking and smoking. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind that overpriced laboratory equipment. 
This is a DIY contraption for all you biohackers out there. What? Whoa, hold up. Biohacking? That sounds scary. Well, no, just think of it as something as simple as making beer or wine or even cheese. Okay, Maria, so you're saying that we have always been biohackers? Exactly, Maria. So to get started, we're gonna need just one more very special ingredient. And we will tell you right after a quick but essential break. Okay, so can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay. So then the next. Um, so the next and kind of last thing that I've been exploring with hormone hacking is. Um, yeah, so I've been working with these mushrooms that are in this class of white rot mushrooms and they have these enzymes that are for digesting cellulose and lignin which is like usually on trees so you find them growing on dead trees um they are also able to break down plastics and so i was in this residency with paula pin and ryan hammond and we were kind of developing this or, or trying to recreate this scientific experiment, which is a decolorization experiment. So we grow the mushrooms on a blue agar and the blue color. Looks like we lost Mary or, okay, we're calling her back in a bit. Blue mushrooms on an agar. That's where we're in. Decolorization. Decolorization? Yeah. So removing the color of From the blue agar. Okay. Yeah. We're back in so the kitchen. <laughs> yes, we're back in the kitchen, literally. I love that when she said about we've always been biohacking. Mm -hmm. You know, just like when you just compare it to like making cheese, fermentation processes. Yep, yep, exactly. And also when you think about the microbiome of our bodies and how we change that through different types of foods that we eat, fermentation. Just like the, na you mean the, the natural process yeah, of how our bodies uh, like go through the Well, and, and the different types of organisms that are already living in us, the different fungi and and bacteria and, and things like that. For me, that really poses the question of, well, how do we decolonize our ourselves, our bodies, uh, our environments, and the planetary? So um, that's kind of a new uh, research trajectory. Mary? And then when I was doing my residency in Indonesia, I was incorporating this in an installation that I did um, uh, about the river pollution there. So this is kind of a trilogy of pieces. Um, it's from this residency that I did in, to, in 2019. And I wanted to do a very site-specific residency and actually work with people who uh, live in this very marginalized area along the river. And actually, they, they live in the river's toxic embrace. I mean, it's a highly polluted river with plastics everywhere. And this is the reality that they're that they're um, born into. Um, I also collaborated with a organiz or yeah, like a artist initiative, a citizen initiative called Life Patch. And they were already investigating the river for many years. And I kind of just joined the project. And they did lots of mapping. And these are kind of um, some examples of the mapping that they did. And what I found really interesting was that um, when you arrive there, you can't separate daily daily life from the Javanese mysticism that exists there. And so we quick we quickly realized, you know, if we're going to ask people to care about the river as if it's their own bodies, you know, we have to incorporate some kind of Javanese mysticism into this kind of practice. Um, 
as you can see, the river splits the city in half from north to south. And the people there actually see it as a highway that connects two spiritual kingdoms, one in the north and one in the south. And so this kind of, um, this is part of their cosmology, you know? So um, this experience really taught me that um, you have to maintain a certain level of contextual fluidity to really investigate different sites of, of toxicity. So um, I was collecting trash from the river and I created this um, rotating mandala projection that is part of the installation that you see here. And um, I kind of see this as um, representing the kind of um, all of these recombinations that happen inside of our bodies, you know, like from everything that we consume, like all of these consumer products, um, packaging, things like that, like they all go inside our bodies and they create new mutations and new new uh, recombinations. And it, it really, um, for me, I see these molecules as uh, molecules that we're all becoming with. So molecules that we're, we're so entangled with. And one of the questions that um, I'm really focused on right now is how to live, act, and care in a permanently polluted world. Um, because all of the kind of hormone hacking that I showed earlier was more a way, like, a way to investigate these molecules to actually turn something invisible visible. And this is already like super revolutionary to see something that you didn't know existed previously. But now it's like, how do you react to that? You know, what kinds of strategies do we create after now knowing these like scandalous levels of estrogen in, in the river supply or like in the world, you know? So um, I'm really focused on this question right now. Um, I'm really interested in the kinds of narratives and the cultural discourse that we have around toxicity, especially how it relates to body and gender. So for example, I came across this scientific paper that had the, the phrase hopeful monster um, inside the, the title of the paper because what they did was they created a hermaphrodite fish by, by accident, like by breeding these two species of fish. And uh, it got me thinking like, why can't our, you know, mutating, queering bodies also be considered hopeful? Because there is a lot of kind of fear and panic about our bodies changing. And a lot of it has to do with this transphobic, homophobic, xenophobic, discourse that is like dominating the media at the moment or even before this moment so this is just like a screenshot of a blog post that i that i found like someone writing about like oh the water supply is making all of the men gay and we need to have men and women you know propagating the species you know very heteronormative and we should talk about this instead of like immigrants crossing our borders you know so it's like um this is the the discourse that that we're dealing with today and of course we can't forget like how bodies that are existing outside these categories like the way that they are that they, that they are pathologized for example you know babies when they're born in the hospital in the u.s if their, if their genitalia is ambiguous, they will try to perform a surgery to make the child more male or more female. So why are we acting out of this, this fear, this panic of bodies being outside categories? And can we have categories without this level of violence? Like, can we still have taxonomies without, you know, this, this level of, um, of uh, violence against the norm. So I, I'm i starting to move in a more like performance direction and a lot of my performance tactics are revolving around this, um, this like kind of act one, act two, act three. So I call it a three-step process for living in an increasingly queer world. So step one, toxicities. You live in an alien landscape that is colonized by hormones. Step two, semiosis. You are already alien. You have hormones in your, you have plastics in your blood, in your urine, and in your fat cells. 
And step three, subjectivities, do you want to be more alien than you already are? So um, this last step, sub subjectivities, this is like ideally the, the point where I want to take you after taking you through like, you know, toxicities and like, you know, we're living in this completely permanently polluted landscape and then and then finding out that you're already alien we are becoming with these molecules and then the last step subjectivities is really a, a place where we have neutralized the fear we have neutralized the panic and we can come up with new relationships or ways to relate to the world that are free from these heteronormative patriarchal structures so um this is a a performance participatory performance project called molecular queering agency and i basically invite people on stage to come with me and to offer some of their urine samples so that we can worship the urine in this like aluminum fountain on stage and everyone is wearing these masks and here's like a more updated version of the performance so these masks that they're wearing, um, you can see on the picture in the right, uh, these are oxygen masks that are uh, connected to hormones that have been extracted from other participants. So um, when, when they put this on, they are basically consenting to be colonized by foreign molecules. And this is such a crucial step because we never are offered the consent to live in this world. Like we're just born here and then it's like completely toxic and no one asked us if we want to live in this way. And so the performance I think is very much about consent. It's about saying like, yes, I choose to be part of this world. Um, we are worshiping this urine as if, you know, like this is a, an evidence of our disobedience. You know, we all have a disobedient body according to the categories that have given, that have been given to us. So, um, the last project I'm going to talk about is a project called genital panic. And this is a project that's very much in the beginning stages. It's kind of speculative. But um, I'm imagining like a queer feminist population study where um, I'm going to create this online database of 3D genital scans. And these 3D genital scans will be um, anonymously crowdsourced by like whoever wants to participate. And um, this database, um, ideally this database, if I have enough genitals, will serve as the basis of what I'd like to call um, a new era of redefined genital aesthetics in the toxic era. So maybe I should just play the video because, yeah, it's okay. So I'm going to um, ask the organizers to please play the genital panic video now. In response to the policing of non-normative bodies in the midst of omnipresent environmental toxicity, genital panic calls upon anonymous digital archives of our toxic queering bodies. Since the rise of industrialization and the chemical alteration of the planet, we all live in a profoundly polluted world that was deeply tied to patriarchy and capitalism. The AGD, or the distance between the anus and genitals, is a widely used measurement in animal and human studies for assessing reproductive toxicity. Controlled by androgen levels in utero, 
It is also a sexually dimorphic trait, where male-identified bodies exhibit 50 to 100% longer distance than female-identified bodies. However, this may no longer be true. In a 2015 Swedish study, scientists have shown that exposure to endocrine-disrupting molecules like microplastics has been directly linked to a shorter than normal AGD. This is an example of molecular queering in action, where many have strongly argued is a toxic assault on the male body and the end to our reproductive future. The genitals are the most gendered organ of our bodies, while the anus is the most universal. Their growing proximity tells us something about where our anatomical existence wants to go. Is it possible that we are all approaching intersex, other sex beings? Isn't it time for new taxonomies? Isn't it time to redefine genital aesthetics? In the wake of hormonal disruption, we see that our bodies are not as fixed and permanent as we always believed them to be. This planetary alienation urges us all to reconsider the dominant definitions of the normal body and how bodies outside the norm have always been and continue to be pathologized. Some examples include the medicalization of infants born with ambiguous genitalia, the disqualification of intersex athletes from their gendered categories on the basis of endocrinology and sex chromosomes. These guidelines matter. What they entail matter. They determine how we are policed, how we are surveilled, due to our biology, whether or not we fall within the oppressive norm. In response to the policing of non-normative bodies, amidst the queer realities of the polluted planetary, Genital Panic seeks to simulate a large-scale population study that anonymously collects 3D genital scans. The scans are collected through performative intervention. Inside of a fake gynecology office, the user is instructed to privately measure their AGD and scan their own genitals using non-proprietary 3D scanning software. In the software's interface, users are asked to enter basic demographic data that intentionally chooses their gender identity over their gender assigned at birth. Disrupting the most traditional and patriarchal models of performing data science. The data is collected in an online crowdsourced archive, called, the Alien Genital Database, or, the Archive of Unruly Bodies. This data would serve as the foundation for a new era, of redefined genital aesthetics, defined by the very users who submit their data. Bodies are not born, they are made. So if state and corporate sciences reinforce certain somatic fictions about the body, then so can we. If the AGD is a tool of patriarchal science, then it must be repurposed for social resistance. For the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. Participating in this database represents a counter-hegemonic strategy that dismembers the tool of AGD from the domain of the state and its symbolic order. It acknowledges our bodies as unfixed and changeable in this queering landscape. It creates spacious room for all our toxic variants, 
For all the aliens living among us, the alien genital database is for all disobedient bodies. All the toxic queer, queer is perpetuity, queer is ubiquity. Toxic queer disrupts, perverts, destabilizes, hegemonic symbolic order, and ultimately, six, eight year old, reproductive futurism. We write our own future. Thank you, Mary. Was that okay. the end of the presentation, or do you hear me? So, let's see. Mary, can you hear me? I guess I will just end on this slide, which is what I like to call the six point plan for hormone querying resistance. I don't really want to read all of this text, but. Um, I just want to call attention to the last one, which is number six. Consider the microperformativity of hormones as an agential power of not only molecular colonization, but also molecular collaboration. So I want us to think about molecules as molecules that we are co-mattering with, that we are co-creating with, that we are being co-created and co-produced by molecules. And I want us to get to a point where we are just free of these, like, um, of like the apocalyptic visions, the threats to reproductive futurism. I want us to get all, like, get past that and just come to this point where we are coexisting with molecules and we are also agents in this change that's happening. Like, we do have agency in this process the molecules of agency as well. And this is where we can come to this neutral space of breeding new subjectivities of, again, like thinking about that question of how to live and act in this permanently polluted world. So thank you very much. And um, I'm looking forward to any questions. Thank you very much, Mary, for this exciting and rich presentation uh, that you gave us. Also, there was a part that we missed that I would like to ask you on. Um, the I think there was we had a technical difficulty, like a glitch, uh, where you were speaking about the decolorization of a blue algae and its relation to mushroom, and there I felt that there was a crossover with uh, the presentation where Adriana left off with the Lycum. Um, but further than that, if somebody would like to ask on that as well, we can uh, open up the, that conversation. But to start off, um, I'm curious about the if you could elaborate more on the when you call something toxicity but you're still trying to reclaim it as part of like the disalienation. So you're even in particular in the locality of the river in Indonesia where you were working on with the plastics, but also the pharmaceutical and industrial and agricultural uh, pollution and, and waters. So there is this abundance of estrogen that is thrown into the, into the waters as a byproduct of these industries but then as well as we before we were talking uh, Adriana before we started this panel there is also huge gatekeeping on who gets these um, hormone replacement medications and uh, availability and therefore Mary going to the extent of like having this little kid that opens so where do we like one on ownership of these uh, of these molecules 
versus the abundance and then the just a bit of framing on the toxicity of it mm -hmm. if any of you could answer that um yeah sure i mean so i think what's very interesting and what's great about the pairing here with mary and i is sort of we're approaching these questions from different but also sort of like triangulating in a sense uh perspective so for me the sort of the this idea of you know for for, 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 for some people for, like i was saying earlier i'm really sort of addicted to estrogen <laughs> in a sense right and so for some people who are trans or non-binary or gender performing gender non-conforming who you know d take hormones this need to sort of adjust our internal hormonal balance is something that has to be satisfied <laughs> in a sense and so having the access outside of the medical establishment and the gatekeeping you know is really necessary for that because as you know mary's film so brilliantly does you know there is this extensive very challenging processes that people often have to go through and it exists in all sorts of countries like the netherlands <laughs> the, the gatekeeping for trans healthcare in the netherlands is quite extensive and so you know trying to create different types of tools or practices that would potentially allow us access to these particular molecules that we want is very important to me. Um, and something that I'm also exploring a little bit in my current research um, is how we may be able to get access to some of these hormones uh, through different types of botanical means. And so looking at different types of plants or fungi that per could perhaps help us in this. Uh, if I may respond, um, uh, that's a very, very interesting question because when I first uh, started researching, it was very much about this issue of access and who is producing hormones and who gets to have them. And But then when I entered this like environmental toxicity area of research, um, I felt that there was a tension because on the one point, um, people are trying to actively queer themselves. And this is a very important quest for them. And it's often like a, an issue of life and death in a way. And, um, but at the same time, all bodies are being uh, passively queered. So there's a, by these environmental toxicities. And so you have this, um, this parallel process of active queering and, and passive queering, and there's a tension there. And the way that I kind of united these tensions is that um, I think the, the, the biggest issue here is about body sovereignty. Like how much agency do you have over your own body? Because you can be actively queering your body by taking uh, hormone replacement therapy or by taking um, birth control pills. Uh, and if you're exposed to a lot of microplastics and these other industrial molecules, this can really interfere with the medication that you need to survive. So, um, so it's it's not that big of a tension after all, but it's an interesting one. Yes, and also being um, complicit and. Yeah, like at the same, like critical and complicit with these industries, I guess, like in the similar um, action of extracting estrogen from urine or, or hormones from urine, like also hacking and leeching on these industries for, in a way, doing a, like an action from multiple sides of depolluting, but also extracting <laughs> the waste of those, um, of those byproducts uh, and the systems. I'd love to hear some questions from our live audience as well as our audience online, if anybody would like to, uh, to pose a question to Adriana and Mary. I like the microphone. Um, thank you so much, this was really incredible to hear also the, the uh, synergy between the different conversations. Um, I'm, I'm curious, for, for both presentations, it's kind of a biological technic technical question. Is it possible, instead of 
um, say focusing on getting certain molecules to increase or change our receptivity or sensitivity towards thing certain things. I was intrigued by this because of the um, sort of the thread in Mary's presentation where they were picking up on this sort of how other molecules also can kind of trigger these receptors we have. They might be designed or like I say designed, oops, um, uh, evolved <laughs> for for estrogen, but they can also be triggered by other things. C can we tweak that end of things? Is that an option? Mary, do you want to go with that first? So are you suggesting to make the estrogen receptor less promiscuous? Or more. <laughs> or more. <laughs> <laughs> um... I mean that's that's really interesting. Um, I I would have to think about how that would be done uh, in a technical way. Um, maybe there's some kind of like we need to redesign the estrogen receptor, I guess. But then like it has to replace all of our receptors, you know, this new design. So maybe there's some kind of gene therapy technique that like makes us all like very highly selective <laughs> estrogen receptor people. I don't know. Very speculative question, but I love it. Yeah, no, totally. I mean, it's it's a, sort of a fascinating idea. I mean, one thing that I will say um, as someone who's on hormone replacement therapy <laughs> is that, you know, pharmaceuticals are very concentrated, right? And so sometimes... <laughs> Sometimes it's very hard to sort of titrate and adjust that because of the concentration of it. And in a certain sense, I think maybe the question is not only about the receptivity, but also what other types of molecules are coming along with the estrogen for the ride, right? So if I'm taking an estrogen patch, I'm getting pure estrogen from that. And that adjusts my, that affects my body in very strong ways. Um, so much so that if I don't have the usual dosage of estrogen, I sometimes will experience menopause-like symptoms. Um, so perhaps the question is more about something that is more, um, yeah, combined or allied with other types of molecules that maybe we have to identify ourselves or that we have to sort of, you know, do more research on. And so this is actually one of the reasons why I'm exploring some of these botanical methods as potential ways of, yeah, engaging with estrogen in a way that isn't so intense <laughs> sometimes. Does this uh, relate to your current project as well, an experiment and tweaking as well the testicular gland into producing estrogen? Does this uh, uh, relate? And I mean, in, in a certain sense, it is related to what, you, what you're talking about, which is sort of about this desire to turn on particular genes that already exist in the body but are just not expressed in that particular cell. So in this case, you know, like, you know, uh, we could potentially turn on genes to have more estrogen receptors being being produced in a particular cell. Um, the, all of these things, uh, the devil's in the details. <laughs> and actually making it work and stick is a very challenging uh, thing. Right. Um, Rion, do we have a, I can't see you from the line. Do we have a question from the audience online? We don't have a question on audio. Do we have a question from the audience live? Okay, yes. Shall I give you the microphone? Um, incredible presentations, thank you very much. Um, I was just wondering, and which is a quite of a big, uh, but also maybe a hard question to ask, but also, what is for you at the moment uh, the most interesting frontier of the practice that, that you work with? You're both very active at the frontier, but are there also parts that you find very interesting that might consider researching or bring into your practice? Mary, do you want to go first? Mm, um, what do you, can you define this frontier?
Yeah, thank you. It's a very good question. Uh, what I mean with the frontier is maybe um, like breaking open this pharmaceutical boundaries and all the kind of challenges you, you face on the way while you're doing your work. With what, is a, what is a very interesting and very uh, uh, promising uh, step forward, uh, if I may say. Um, okay, so I guess, hmm. Well, there's 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 a couple of ways that I would actually answer that question. One of which is not high tech or really sort of pushing any you know new directions, but is actually super important, which is different types of uh, groups that are involved in the sharing of hormones, right? Um, sort of creating these solidarity, mutual aid types of groups, um, some of which are very active here in Amsterdam, to try and you know, be able to share excess hormones that people have. You know, um, this is incredibly important, again, because of this gatekeeping and everything like this. I mean, I think um, you know, there's, there's some really interesting research and art practice going on with one of you know, Mary's collaborators, Ryan Hammond, who's also looking at the sort of the histories of where different forms of hormones are derived from and what types of plant sources they're coming from and the relationship with that to different types of colonial and extractivist histories in Latin America. I mean, one thing that's actually very, very difficult to know is for the estrogen that I get from the pharmacy, where is it coming from in the world? Because it's actually a trade secret. Um, we know that the usual process is that it comes from soy, but where is that soy being produced, mm. right? You know, what is that history? What, where, you know, is it being done in an ethical way? Mm -hmm. Not entirely sure about that, right? So, so what is all the processes of this? Um, I think that's that. I think that's a very important question that still needs to be to be resolved. Um, and I don't, you know, that, that that's something that's going to require different types of uh, work and activities to try and uncover those things. For you, Mary, would you like to answer that question as well within your practice? What are frontiers that you're up against and and coming up for you as well to challenge? I mean, um, actually, actually uh, Adriana mentioned a couple of examples that I was kind of thinking of. Um, for example, the work of Brian Hammond. Um, Brian is actually developing um, a platform for open source hormones, but using, I think, transgenic uh, yeast or transgenic plants, um, which I think is a very important project because it's also questioning these kinds of legal frameworks for, you know, because this this kind of um, plant production of hormones uh, is being done by huge companies. Um, as a kind of alternative to synthetic production of hormones. Because as we all know, estrogen and progesterone are the most highly manufactured synthetic compounds in the world because they're highly lucrative for the pharmaceutical industries. Um, but the fact that Ryan is developing this as like an independent artist and it's meant to like be shared in a very decentralized way, you know, because like you just have to take care of the yeast, take care of the plants and you can share very easily. Um, I think it's a it's it's a very groundbreaking project and um, and I do like wonder, I mean also they wonder, you know, if they would be caught in some kind of like legal trap, like if this does become a very like popular way of sharing uh, molecules. Um, so I think that's a really interesting project. Thank you. Do we have time for one last question? No? I have a burning question, but it opens up a lot. <laughs> but I would like to end with this, because, I mean, in a way, you answered that question on the, on the uh, hormonal uh, manufacturing, but there is also, like, an, uh, through my previous question, talking about complicity with also all these other industries, I'm curious about your relation as well with NASA and these huge rockets being going up space and this huge carbon uh, use that and like all the fuel that is used in this process and 
but maybe in a nutshell or speaking a bit summary, but that can open up our minds for the rest of the night and tomorrow's and coming up events about um, with your Transino uh, lab project, how, what do you think it offers us in this period for our ecological crises and what kind of vision are you sketching um, and yeah, experimenting with? Yeah, sure. No, I mean, that's something that I've been thinking about <laughs> a lot. So I will try and answer it, you know, somewhat concisely. <laughs> um, so, you know, the, the um, uh, with respect to this particular project that went to space, um, it was already a rocket that was going to go to the space station um, for a resupply mission uh, to the space station. And so there was a little bit of space on it, and they said, hey, finally, you know, we're going to give a little bit of space for the artists, right? Um, so, so for me, you know, this is, this is hopefully a potential to, to sort of imagine different ways of being up there and different types of presences and bodies and different types of experiences. Um, but uh, with respect to sort of like, yeah, um, these Xeno futures and the, and the Transino lab and things like this, you know, I think it really goes back to um, what I started with, with this <laughs> mouthful of a word, xenomogrification, right? This disalienation from sort of the constraining aspects of capitalism, right? So developing the new tools to sort of push us into these other areas um, and other ways of being. And I think, you know, sort of a lot of um, Mary's projects very much resonate <laughs> um, with this um, as well. But, you know, I think um, also, especially with this question of complicity, I, th I feel like in a sense we have to, I, I'm, I'm of the opinion that we have to engage with these technologies and try and mutate them basically from within. Um, and that is not going to be perfect. And for me, I tend to look at projects on very long-term timescales, so decades, hundreds of years, and so forth, and sort of like how can we be, you know, engage with these processes to try and try and shift things a little bit. I'm, I'm very humble <laughs> with, with this, that we're not going to be able to necessarily shift it a lot or maybe as much as it needs to be, but some shifting and mutation and, and modulation needs to happen. Thank you so much. And with this, I think we need to come to a wrap for our evening. Thank you so much for our audience present with us in the space. Thank you for the technicians and for the organizers for putting up this amazing panel, for inviting you. Thank you so much, Adriana, for being present thank with you. us. Mary, thank you so much for being present with us virtually and, uh, and also for our virtual audience. Um, I would also like to remind you that there are two more days remaining of the festival and I do have the schedule here. Um, tomorrow we have our wait, pile of papers, but tomorrow we do have, have our talk um, starting at 1.30 in this space on melting mind and body. And the second talk for tomorrow will be uh, if this is our end, what then? And that will be at 4 o'clock. I hope to see you there as well, and thank you very much, and good night.